So here we are in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3. We are returning now to analyzing this brilliant book, the book of another prophet. As you know, we had to make uh, a long pause, a long break, because we, first of all, had the pre-Passover preparation period. And I'm very happy to say that uh, it is now the second year in the row, I think. Is it the second? I think it's the second year in the row that we have been really diligently examining ourselves and diligently explaining and analyzing what it means to analyze ourselves. I'm very happy that the Feast of Unleavened Bread has went very well after many kind of pre-Passover trials. I'm sure that all of you kept the Passover with dignity and in proper, in proper way, in proper order. I'm also happy to say that here in Serbia, at least, I'm very happy with even with the, the offerings, considering not not a brilliant economic situation. The offerings were really uh, impressive. So I'm very happy to see that the faith of all of us is uh, growing, it's, stu- it's steady, and that we do believe that God will provide for us in whatever situation and wherever, in whatever circumstance we, f- we may find ourselves. So let's go to chapter 3 now. Let's return to Jeremiah and cover cover this prophet. It's amazing how many things we do have in these prophetic books that we can, in these days, in this day and age, understand much better. Even though Prophet Jeremiah, I'll remind you, was the prophet for his, for the house of Judah, of his time, and he was prophesying just before, just before the fall of the house of Judah into captivity, into Babylonian captivity. I'll remind you again, for the sake of biblical history, so that you would have a, that you will have a better view and understanding of it, that prior to the house of Judah, the northern ten tribe house of Israel had fallen 130 years before the house of Judah did, had fallen into the hands of Assyrians, and they were taken out of their land, they were kicked out of their land, and their land was populated then by the five Babylonian tribes. From that kind of tribes later came <laughs> Simon Magus, infamous Simon Magus, who is mentioned in the New Testament. The kingdom of Judah continued to live for about 130 years still, with the Jewish kings now inheriting the throne of David, which is also the throne of Israel. That throne was later, by this very prophet, Prophet Jeremiah, was transplanted from Judah to scattered Israel, who in the meantime migrated to northwest Europe. And with Israelites pride, there was... uh, there was also the tribe of Zera. It is Zera is or Zara is actually the son of Judah. Judah had two twins, Phares and Zara. From Phares came the line of King David, which ruled in the Middle East. However, the other the other family, Zera or Zara, did not have any chance to rule on the same throne. So they migrated with all of these migrating Israelite tribes, they migrated to the British Isles to Ireland, where they established a royal house. So you can say that the house of Judah was kind of divided when it comes to royalty, but then Jeremiah took the daughter of the last Jewish king, Zedekiah, with him to Northern Ireland. She married the uh, prince from the Zera family. So finally that breach between the brothers was healed, and from that union came a long, long list of rulers of Ireland, later of Scotland, and later of England or Britain. So basically today the Davis throne is right there, still in London, and the longest ruling British monarch is now still there, and that's the fulfillment of the uh, covenant God made with David. Because God said if today there will be no sunset and if tomorrow there will be no sunrise, only then would he break his word he had given to David. And that the word he gave to David was that always, always there would be a descendant of David on that throne. Now interestingly enough, uh, Jesus Christ, King of Kings, uh, when it comes to his line, birth line, through Mary, he was indeed a descendant of King David. Now, when he comes back as the King of Kings, the throne is going to be returned from London to Jerusalem, and he will be on that throne, which means that since he is the descendant of King David, that means that God, what God said will be true forever. 
there'll be always, always the uh, ruler from the th- from the house of David on that throne. Then, so the king of the kingdom of Judah continued to exist until the Babylonian captivity, and then uh, when the, they were taken captive, they remained into captivity for seventy years. Now, the Babylon Empire eventually was on decline, and it was conquered by the Persians. The Persians then basically took over those Babylonian captives. The Persian king Cyrus was, uh, well, no wonder he gave a decree for the Jews who wanted to return and rebuild the Holy Land and rebuilt the uh, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem and other cities in Judea. He permitted the Jews to go there. One of the reasons might be because don't remember, don't forget on the Persian, on the Persian throne, on the part of the Persian royal house was also <laughs> the famous queen in the Bible, Queen of, uh, Queen Esther, the Queen of Persia. And so therefore she was the queen mother, you know, at that time when King Cyrus was the king of Persia. So King King of, you know, King Cyrus was obviously influenced by her as well. He gave a decree for the Jews to return. And so, headed by Ezra and Nehemiah, they returned uh, to restore or rebuild the Judea and rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem. And so that will be, in short, uh, in short, the uh, what happened after the fall. But before the fall, just before the fall of the house of Judah, Jeremiah the prophet was the one who prophesied to everyone, to all the echelons of the Jewish society, that their imminent fall is there. Of course, as always, people did not want to listen to the devil. They always want to hear smooth things, you know. There is, I always remember, prophet Isaiah, when God says to him, well, when they, the people, says to Isaiah, oh, don't tell us those hard things, no, Preach to us smooth things, you know. So here are the things that were not smooth in the Jewish society and Prophet Jeremiah warned them that because of their sins that they did not repent of, the fall was imminent and it was a thorough fall. The Jewish society was completely destroyed, brethren, completely destroyed. But it was out of that remnant of the Jewish society, the King's daughters survived, and out of that that remnant, Prophet Jeremiah was able to, as chapter 1 says, to uh, destroy the throne of David in Judah and and replant it in Israel. Interestingly enough, the other other daughter of, of King Zedekiah, she married a Spanish prince. Her name was Scotta, by the way, so Scotland may be named after her as well. Uh, she mar- uh, so she married the Spanish prince on the prince on the Iberian Peninsula. So that kind of history is also very interesting, and it is so many. There are so many interesting things from this relative society that uh, I, I need to bring to your attention. Another thing. This is now a digression. You'll forgive me, but I have to say because I mentioned it today in Serbian. Brethren Josephus writes. And he was the contemporary of Jesus Christ and the apostles. So in the first century, he writes that Judea, where Jesus Christ was born, that Judea was the protectorate of Rome. But he says, beyond the Euphrates River, there are many of those of the ten tribers who lived there. Now, brethren, what was beyond Euphrates? What was beyond the Euphrates River? That's what our Romanized, falsified history would never tell you. Beyond the Euphrates River was a mighty empire, a mighty Parthian empire, which was composed of the ten tribers. And that's because they were, it was a mighty empire which defeated the so-called unconquerable Roman army about three times. That is why in our falsified history you basically hear nothing of Parthia, you never hear anything about that mighty empire that was made up of those who were of the ten tribes. There is a book in English written by Stephen Collins, which I wholeheartedly recommend to all of you to read, because then you would also understand 
some things like those so-called three magi. They were not three magi at all. Nobody does it say in the Bible there were three magi. You will learn from that book how many magi were there, who were they, and why did they come to Jerusalem. Not only three of them, but there was a whole caravan of them. And why did they come to Jerusalem to bow down to the Jewish king? So from that Parthian Empire, they came the big migration of nations later, who, of course, did the Israelitish tribes who settled then into Europe. But it is amazing what is there in the history. And when you know all this historical background, brethren, the biblical account becomes all the more exciting and all the more relevant for all of us. So with that kind of, I wanted to give you this kind of reminder because this is all important as we analyze the book of Jeremiah. So in chapter 3, verse 1, they say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. So they say, you see, so now we find out who they are. So we have, we all have a common saying, you know, a common proverb, they say. Some people jumped in the past to say that how these verses actually apply to adultery. Well, they did not consider that there is a spiritual adultery as well, which is idolatry. And here in this verse says, if a man is the word ish, applying to all humankind, and now we know from Deuteronomy that a man cannot divorce his wife. But now people were saying, well, I made a mistake and I wish I can go back to my first wife. Well, that is not allowed in the Bible. But what about you? God asked them. You committed adultery. No, that's not what it says, brethren. He says, you have played the harlot with many lovers. That's what he says that they have done. So it's not like adultery, which, you know, an incident of adultery may happen. No, this was their lifestyle, brethren. Lifestyle. Later in the chapter, he mentions adultery. But we need to be careful about how he uses that word, because he has already said it is not just adultery. You know, playing harlot with many lovers, well, that is the def definition. Yet, return again back to me, returning again back to him, they were expected to do that. You know, oh, let's play harlots and then we'll be returning to the eternal. Well, they don't want, you see, they don't want permanent relations with others when they can just get let, get, get back to the first person. Oh, well, don't we find that with humans? They want to have, you know, someone, someone to cook for them, someone to clean for them, take care of the children and be there for them when they want it. But at the same time, you know, they want to run around as well. Well, God says, no, 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 no. You cannot do that, you know. If you are pleased to dwell with someone, that means you are setting yourself apart for that person exclusively. But they thought, you know, they could just play the heart with many lovers, many gods, and go back to God and that they should be allowed to do that. To do that. No, brother, that, of course, is not true. So in summary of this verse, we have in this verse the analogy... From the Old Testament, a man divorces his wife and she enters into marriage with another. She cannot go back to her first husband if anything happens, but God will accept Israel back when she repents and changes. Verse 2. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see. Where have you not been lain with men? By the road you have set for them like an Arabian in the wilderness. And you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. This verse shows that a part of that practice in the religion of Astarte or Ishtar was brethren's sexual involvement in the high places. He's also talking about idolatry here with a false religion. We notice what God brands that what they were doing. You know, you have been laying in the high places. You'll be laying in in the high places. You polluted the land with your harlotries and with your wickedness. This is the word again for evil. Ra, where it says wickedness. Ra, with evil. They polluted, you know, the land with your evil. Therefore, verse 3, 
the showers have been withheld, meaning the showers of rain, of course, not the showers <laughs> that we have today. The showers of rain have been withheld, and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. So God is going to cause the nations ready to wake up and learn the lessons by them not getting their early rain and the latter rain. This does not sound like one slip of adultery. You know, you have a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Verse 4. Will you not from this time cry to me, My father, you are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to that end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you are able. Well, brethren, God never cracks down on you immediately because you thought something bad or you did something bad. So we have to be careful about that. You know, how do you know for how long will God reserve his anger? You have spoken and done evil things. The word evil is again the Hebrew word ra. Verse 6. The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there played the harlot. Now Jeremiah, you see, brethren, skips back and forth in time. Now this is the time element in his book. Judah should have seen this, that Israel played a harlot. You see, backsliding Israel. Have you seen the back, what backsliding Israel has done? Backsliding Israel. So he's talking about the ten tribes of Israel again. And what they have done. So God is likening the practices that went on in the name of Easter to what Israel as a nation was doing with lovers. Verse 7. And I said after she had done all these things, return to me. But she said she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Now what is treacherous about it, brethren? Well, remember what Malachi says about it. You are not to deal treacherously with the wife of your youth. So what did the treacherous sister Judah do? How, do, how is the word treacherous used in these passages? Well, let's see the next verse. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. Now, it would be a misinterpretation of this scripture to say that a man put away his wife because of a single act of adultery. You know, if someone slips up and commits sin, the other person can forgive it upon the transgressor's repentance, just like God forgives. But here, it is not a question of an act of adultery. The whole paragraph, the whole context shows us what this is all about. It does not say that the treacherous sister Judah committed adultery also. No, it says that she went and played the harlot also. But he already told us what the Israel did. And now he is saying Judah did it also. Verse 9, so it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. So that is talking about idolatry there. It is talking about spiritual adultery. It is not saying God put anybody away or gave them a divorce for sexual adultery. It is saying spiritual adultery. Because he said what she did physically. You polluted the land with your whoredoms. You committed adultery with many lovers, with so many lovers that she cannot even feel ashamed. You know, they are so steep into it, yet they wanted to return to God in such a state. As we know, God of the Old Testament died so that Israel is now free to remarry. That same God is going to take his wife back again. Verse 10. And yet, for all this her treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. So if you want to know how God defines Judah's religion, here it is, brethren, in pretense, hypocritically, not genuine, not wholeheartedly. Then the Lord said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. 
in Ezekiel chapter 16 is the exact same thing stated, showing how the prophets are brethren always harmonized. Ezekiel 16.26 as well as the rest of that chapter just shows us exactly, you know, the same thing. So we see what what did Israel do? They did not only commit adultery, but fornication with their neighbors, Egyptians. And uh, you can see that in verse 51 in chapter 16. So just like Jeremiah, Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 16 verse 51, that Judah even went beyond of what Israel did. Verse 12, go and proclaim these words towards the north. Notice the north. And say, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. You see the ten tribes, the ten tribes of Israel had gone into captivity and were dragged north by the power that had overrun them. And then when they are broke, when they are brought back, well, they will be brought back, they will come out of the north, you know, the north again. What is north of the, of the promised land? Well, of course, it's Europe. Verse 13, Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God, and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. So, brethren, always, that is the first step. Everybody has to acknowledge their iniquity. You know, so-called Christians are going to be sacrificing at the beginning of the millennium to show how they had plenty of sins. They're not sinless. They're not going God's way. So only acknowledge your iniquity. The Hebrew word for iniquity is avon, which means perversity, that is moral evil, that you have transgressed. So here is the Hebrew word pasha, meaning you have rebelled. So we have three or four different words showing what the house of Israel did, you know. And when we go through repentance, there are different sins we have to repent of. What we are and what we have done that we shouldn't have done. When we think of sin to repent of, there, you know, uh, there is lawlessness, there is iniquity, there is evil, wickedness, transgression, missing the mark. There are a lot of different things, you said, that, that in God's sight are sin. So here, when Israel is told to repent and have God's grace, they have to acknowledge their lawlessness. They have to acknowledge that they have been rebels against the eternal your God, that they have been, that they have scattered their ways. They have taken a bit from the Romans, a bit from the Greeks, a little bit out of Egypt, a little bit from Babylon. They put it all together, brethren, and put a Christian name on it and flag it around as Christianity. That's the modern Christianity today. Verse 14, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I'll take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. Now, return is the same word for repent in Greek language. Return because I'm married to you. Now, how can, how can he say that? He's not even married to them. He already put them away. Well, they were guilty of all these things. Yet, when he brings them out of the North Country and shows grace to them after they acknowledge their past, then he says, I am married to you. No, not I was married to you, nor I will be married to you. But he says, I am married to you. And they will be brought to Zion, which is symbol also for the church. They'll be brought to church, to the church, brethren. And then they will be taught God's ways and you will go out as an example to other countries indeed. Now verse 15. And I'll give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Well, has this ever happened? No, it, this has not happened yet. And uh, it will be happening in the future. I will, he says. So God will set up leadership of nation. So they will always have pastors, brethren. They 
So far, they are having shepherds who are not according to God's heart and who do not feed the modern house of Israel with knowledge and understanding. In fact, when we look at modern Israel, their pastors feed them with pagan traditions with lawlessness. They teach them to hate the law of God. They give them no understanding. All that they feed them is false Jesus Christ, plenty of emotions about the Christ and lawlessness. The modern house of Israel has lost any understanding of who they are and who their God is. Then, verse 16, it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land of those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. We read the phrase in those days, you see. In those days, that's the same phrase that we find in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. So we again see the harmony of the prophets. In that day, in those days, says the Eternal. So the time is coming when we are not going to look to that physical Ark of the Covenant. The Ark may not have even been preserved by God, and certainly there is no need for it in the kingdom. You see, God never punishes for missing the mark that severely. And he hadn't, he didn't punish just for vanity that strongly. But when you get so crooked that you are lawless and revolting and worked, worked in your very being, well then God has to chasten you severely. There is no fear in the hearts of those people that gives the former and the latter rain. That is the way it should be. That is the normal way. In the Bible, days to have rain in the harvest time was unbelievable. In Genesis 8 verse 22, it shows that we don't have to worry about the earth becoming a massive iceberg as they've been threatening us. Brethren, God has guaranteed that there will be harvest seasons. So we're not to worry about this, 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 uh, how do they call it? The, uh, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting some of those worldly terms. We're not to, to worry about these climate changes that it will be result in some kind of the earth becoming a massive iceberg and stuff like that. No. God has guaranteed there will be harvest seasons. So what God says will happen. We don't have to worry about the worldwide flood, as you know. He promised he will never destroy the earth by flood, etc., etc. Verse 17, at that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. Well, as you know, Jerusalem never before had the throne of God, so it will become the dwelling place of the Messiah, you see. So, brethren, then all the countries of the earth are going to have one God, one religion, headquartered in Jerusalem. The word imagination uh, or uh, dictates of their follow of their hearts, but there is a word imagination somewhere, I think, in one of the translations. And uh, the dictates of their evil hearts or imaginations of their evil hearts literally means stubbornness in Hebrew. We find that word eight times in Jeremiah. It is indeed kind of unusual that this word is only in Jeremiah and also it is in Psalm 81 outside of the first five books. However, we find it in Deuteronomy 29.19. And yet, why we would we have a word that is used in the law that is not used anywhere else except in Jeremiah and also once in Psalm 81. Well, yet it shows how the whole thing tie in together. So no more walking after the stubbornness of their evil hearts. No more walking or following the dictates of their evil hearts. No. Evil, again the Hebrew word ra. No more of that. We have it once again, just to for you if you are following with the notes. We find that word Deuteronomy 29.19. We find that word in Psalm 81. And we find it, find it eight times in Jeremiah. Including this verse 17, which says the dictates of their evil hearts or the imaginations of their evil hearts. But the better translation in Hebrew is the stubbornness 
of their evil hearts. Verse 18, in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together, again, there's this verse in those days, they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. So notice, brethren, the setting has been bringing them out of their captivity from the north, pouring grace on them. They have acknowledged their sin. God is married to them. He takes out from among them and brings them to the church, Zion, symbolically. He gives them pastors, they no longer say the Ark of the Covenant, but Jerusalem is going to be called the throne of God and all the nations are gathered to Jerusalem. Judah and Israel are going to be reunited, gathered back to the promised land. Now please consider verse 18. How are these people that say that the Jews who are currently living in the promised land, that they represent all the 12 tribes of Israel, how are they going to explain this verse and that context? How? It says the house of Judah will walk together with the house of Israel. They'll be united. They'll come out of the northern land and they'll, you know, they'll be living in the land which is inheritance to their fathers because remember God promised to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob that that promised land will be given to them and their descendants forever. So if you consider the content, content of this verse 18, now you explain to me how can a little country of state of Israel in the promised land represent all the 12 tribes of Israel? How? There is no way that they can answer that, brethren. Those who claim that ludicrous thing, some of them are my good friends who, well, the publisher of my book he used to be a minister. He He believes that kind of Illogical notion. I, I, I don't know how else to term it. It's illogical completely. There's no way that, you know, they can answer several things here in Jeremiah that we have been reading about. This verse mentions all the families of the house of Israel. So in those days that he has been depicting in this paragraph, we have been reading in those days. Judah is still an independent house living in a different country. And in fact, the Hebrew terminology, it is uh, uh, it is even worded, instead of saying, they shall walk with the house of Israel, it literally says, they shall go unto the house of Israel. You see, they shall go unto the house of Israel. Incredible. And they shall come together. The word come here means that they shall enter the land of the promise at the same time. So how can anybody believe that, you know, the small state of Israel, the Jewish country today, the Jewish state today, it represents all the 12 tribes of Israel. When the whole Bible testifies to us that there will be reunification of the two houses at the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 19, But I said, How can I put you among the children? And give you a pleasant land, a beautiful heritage of the hosts of nations. And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from me. So now they're back with God and God is their father, you see. Verse 20, surely, as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. And surely, brethren, as the wife treacherously departs from her husband, that is how God uses this word treacherously. It is most of the times related to marriage and how you deal with one another in marriage. For a wife to depart from her husband, that is treacherous. And for a husband to depart from his wife, that is treacherous. So he addresses here the house of Israel, which means that he is probably talking about the ten tribes going back to the time when Israel, like a wife who treacherously departed from her husband, that is what they did to God, you see. Verse 21, a voice was heard on the desolate heights, weeping and supplication of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, they have forgotten the Lord their God. So right after they have committed all of their abominations, lewdness and wretchedness, they're right back weeping over them. Verse 22, return, you backsliding children, 
and I'll heal your backslidings. Again, we have it in plural. It says children. They are not one country. They are not one nation, brethren. The modern ten tribes have now different nations that they form. There are ten different nations. Ten different nations in Europe, Northwest Europe, on British Isles, and also in the United States of America. So we have it in plural. Plus there is the Jewish state there. So we have the difference. We have all those 12 tribes, including the house of Judah in those 12, 12 tribes having different countries today. And that's why you have children in plural, of course. Verse 23. Truly, in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. He's alluding to the worship places they had on hills and mountains, and, and, and mountains of course. Truly, in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. So we can take that either where they worship their gods, indeed, the gods they worship from the hills and mountains, or we can take it all the countries and the kingdoms they depended on in vain. They hoped for any salvation from their allies. Just like in the very last days, the modern house of Israel will hope, expect, put all of his hope in their allies. But no, there will be nobody to help. Because God always wanted to be the ally to the house of Israel, but the house of Israel always treacherously dealt with God and had not only one one other husband. No, they treacherously harlotted with many lovers. Verse 24, For shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. So all their labor were in paganism, brethren, and idolatry. All these things have been devoured in the labor of their heathenism. Verse 25, we lie down in our shame and our reproach covers us for we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers from our youth even to this day and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. What it says here we have sinned against the Lord our God that really means we missed the mark. Verse 26 